Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Straight Talk. I'm one of the hosts, one of the hosts, uh, Dr. Van Gaten, the other host, and actually the one who started the show. Uh, I couldn't do it without him, Dr. Dennis Golfin. And we call this program Straight Talk because that's what we're trying to bring is straight talk. And what do we def- how do we define straight talk? Well, to to us, we believe whatever God says is straight. And a biblical worldview is the wisest worldview that any human being on planet Earth can embrace. And so we're not we're trying to bring you primarily what thus saith the Lord from his word and and then secondarily our opinion based on the word. And so we uh, really endeavor to stay, Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. And because we're trying to stay in that way, that truth, and that life, even on this program. And we admit, admit like everyone else, we have our own biases and we have our own pet doctrines, etc. cetera. But we're, we're laboring by the Holy Spirit and God's word to walk under the discipline as true disciples As Jesus said, he only did what he saw his father doing. He only spoke what he heard his father. We're trying to follow that same paradigm by God's grace. And so I'll step aside now and allow our other co-host here to uh, introduce himself as well. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Van. I'm Dr. Dennis Scoffin. Uh, I originate here in Raleigh, North Carolina, and Van's in Jacksonville, Florida. But through the uh, means of technology, we're able to come together like this. I want to first mention that we're both July babies and his birthday is this week and <laughs> our birthday yeah. will be next week. So I think that's a, a good thing. But as he mentioned about the straight talk and what we're attempting to do, uh, we want to we uh, take this show more apologetic, uh, more theological, more hermeneutical in terms of the fact that we want to say just what the Bible say. We might be able to tear down some myths and things that people have about the scripture and about God himself. So we wanna start off today by uh, going into a theme today that we thought would be good to, uh, to get in. We've covered about five uh, sessions on, on racism and dealt with that in terms of having some special guests on and talk about it from a biblical standpoint. And also we highlighted Dr. Van's book, which we're gonna keep highlighting and um, let you know what his book is all about because it it, it does not only just bring uh, some perspective to it, but he has a lot of personal experience. And Dr. Van, I've been talking to a lot of people who are just excited about your personal experience that they've been hearing with the book. I'm hoping they they ordered it, but they listened to your testimony about some of your personal experiences and they were really blessed uh, by that. So as we we come together as two scholars, we have over 90 years of experience in, in the gospel. And so between the two of us, hopefully we can come to some understanding and some uh, clarity to where you are in the word. Today's topic is going to be on reconciliation. So uh, Van, I'm going to let you open up the subject. Okay, well, <clears throat> this is a quick overview, and we'll drill down a little bit here and there, but nothing systematic for sure. Uh, however, uh, we still want to uh, open up the topic, and we'll probably spend more than one week at it, maybe. And uh, reconciliation, the word uh, means to reconcile, that word means to, be, to bring into harmony. And uh, just using that basic definition, we can see that to bring something into harmony really gives, conveys the idea that there is an agreement. And the Bible says that if you read about the, study theology proper, which is a study of God, uh, God has what's called a missio dei, a mission. And out of the missio dei, the mission, he performs the opus dei, the work of God. And so the work of God is because it flows out of the mission of God. What's God's mission? What is the heart of God? What's God after? Well, the scriptures make it clear that when God created planet Earth, okay, let's just start with him. Let's not even talk about him. Well, I, I, I bet, let me back up. We could say that God created first the heavens, according to Job 38, 
uh, verse five mm -hmm. through seven. He, the sons of God, the Bene Elohim, they rejoiced when God created the earth. So the Elohims, the sons of God, had to be here first. So God created the heavens first, and then the earth, and He re He created uh, the uh, Bene, the sons of God, and the archangels and the angels in the invisible realm. Uh, and then on earth, he made the, the visible realm made up of humanity. And his purpose was that God wanted to have a family in heaven and a family on earth. Mm -hmm. And that's really the heart of God. He wants us to be with him, and he wants a harmony between the families. And But in order to be true relationships, God created, uh, he gave free will to the what are called the uh, incorporeal beings, the, the invisible, and the uh, corporeal beings, the visible, uh, invisible and visible. And yet we all have free will. And in that free will, uh, we can choose to uh, be in relationship with God or not be in relationship with God as our father, our creator. And some of the angelic beings uh, chose to rebel, just like on earth, we choose to rebel. And yet it is God's creation. Nobody created heaven or earth, but God. And because he created heaven or earth, he has a right to redeem it if possible. And he did that act of redemption to bring it back into relationship with himself. He wants his children back. He sent his son to die on the cross to bring us back. Now we still have to choose to accept the gospel the good news, the bisera in Hebrew, the, the good news of God, that he's so loving that in spite of us, he's, make, he's made a way. In spite of us, he's made a way. Now, he didn't make a way for the angelic beings. They're out. They're already with him up there, and they don't get a second chance. But humanity, God has given a second chance. And so, again, I want to reiterate that what God is doing is that in order to be reconciled, because that's the mission of God, the mission of God is to bring humans back into right, right relationship with himself. And he's not only reconciling humans, but he's reconciling the planet. He started out with an Eden. He's going to get back to an Eden lifestyle, Edenic lifestyle. And uh, <clears throat> so that's the whole emphasis of redemption. God wants his family back willingly through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, for our sins, our rebellion against him. And we can come back to God, be reconciled through Jesus and his death, burial, resurrection for us to God. And we're grateful for the, he is reconciling us and he's given us a ministry. So maybe we'll do it two parts there. But first of all, recognize that it is God um, who is reconciling the world unto himself. So I'll stop right there. No, no, that's that's good, Dr. Van. And I think that uh, you gave us a good overview of where we are in terms of this reconciliation. Let me kind of um, just put in some, some other notes here. One of the things I want to mention is because of the fall and um, what Adam had done in the garden, that he was driven out of the garden, God began his work of reconciliation. What I love is that he created the world then he created man, and he's going to redeem man, then he's going to redeem the world. So as he started off with the world first, he starts off with man first in redemption, because the last thing God is going to redeem is this planet. So uh, he created the planet first, put man in it, so now he wants to redeem man, so that then he could then start a new world order with mm -hmm. the new world. So this idea of reconciliation mm -hmm. of God trying to get back, man get back in a relationship where he was walking with God in the cool of the day and spending some time with the invisible and the visible coming together. God now takes the whole journey through our Bible to find a way to reconcile us back to him. And um, doing that, of course, through animal sacrifice, where the animal sacrifice covered our sins. But that's only for a temporary fix until, of course, he could get the right man. He was looking for a man that would redeem us. And of course, uh, as, as um, Isaiah 59 says, with his own arm, he brought forth his salvation, uh, which, which many 
in the case that God not only becomes the one who is reconciling, but he becomes the one who reconciles. So he does both work in Christ. So as the father, his desire is to reconcile. In Christ, he becomes the reconciler. So this whole thing comes together of God doing the entire work, complete work. And so with that work of grace, we just have to accept his completed work because not by works of righteousness we have done, as Colossians said, but by his blood and by his uh, sacrifice that he's done this brought us into this idea of reconciliation. Now, until, I think this is so important because Paul brings up uh, really good in 2 Corinthians 5, this whole ministry of reconciliation, the hostility that we've had between God and us. And of course, with the, uh, the temple, the idea of worship, God always brings us to this place of worship. But that's why it's so important to get our doctrine right, because if we don't believe right, we're not going to worship right. And if we don't worship right, we're not going to live right. Mm. Dr. Van? Yes, I, I totally agree with that. <clears throat> and, you know, I think if we look back a little bit through uh, human history, um, uh, one of the acts of God, one of the works of God, the Opus Dei, uh, of God was that he chose a nation, Israel, <clears throat> to be through, through whom he was going to redeem the world, and all the knowledge would, all the world would gain a accurate knowledge of God. By this time after Adam fell and before uh, Abraham came, the world drifted so far from God that even the, a lot of the myths are believed about the Greek gods and this one's and that one's all stem from the, in the garden, they started with truth and you know, truth as generations go by, by fallen men, it gets distorted. So God picked the nation of Israel to restore a true knowledge of himself to the world through using Israel to demonstrate, to be an example, to have the Torah and to share with the world what Yeshua HaMashiach is all about. And notice that he picked a he built a tabernacle when he delivered Israel from Egypt. The first thing he did, he says, listen, you got to build a tabernacle, a tent, so I can dwell with you. Right. And he wanted, he proved that again, I want to be with my creation, especially of humankind. I want to be with you. And then when he established that he's going to be there, but then there was a certain prescription as to the way Israel had to behave themselves if God is in our midst. And the right. rest of the Old Testament or the Sinai narrative, as it is called by scholars, uh, then shows what God is expecting from humanity if we're going to walk with him his way. There's got to be an agreement, an agreement. And throughout the Bible, <clears throat> you know, the scripture says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Right. And so in order to be reconciled with God, we hear the gospel, we, we, we get God's view, and then we have to choose to agree with God's view, and that's how we get reconciled. But if we don't agree with God's view, then we're not reconciled, and we're choosing not to be reconciled. And uh, Paul makes it clear, he says, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, therefore we plead with you. So that's the propagation of the gospel. We share the truth. We share the gospel. We evangelize with lost humanity because they don't realize they're walking in darkness, that they're separate from God, away from God. They're not reconciled to God, but they can be. And when you're lost in the dark and then somebody shines on the light a little bit to let you see, uh, that ought to be good news. I, I don't know any of us <laughs> that like to walk around, especially in the night, you know, when you're trying to go to the bathroom at night, the worst thing is you walk around and stub your foot in the dark. Uh, that's a painful experience. And I think we've all had it before, but nevertheless, we try to avoid that. We want to we walk in the light. Uh, and that's God showing us, the, showing us the way. That's the way for us to be reconciled. Because to be reconciled with God... We, then we gain a better understanding of who we are, what we are, and our own path, what we should be doing in life, what we are meant to be, the imagers of God. We're made in the preposition image 
in the image of God. That's mm -hmm. the wrong preposition. We are made as imagers of God. And therefore, we were made to be like him, not, let me get philosophical here, not a metaphysical participation in the divine essence, <laughs> but an ethical transformation that we become partakers of the divine nature. So in thought, word, and deed, we can be like God. And yet we understand there is the communicable attributes of God, and there are the non-communicable attributes of God. Well, let me let me let me slow you up right there, Ray. Okay. Because I want to I want to go back and cover some of those points that you you went so far. I know we're going to do another show on this, but let me okay. get back to Israel because <laughs> one of the things that we want to talk about and miss that occur is that God only wanted to deal with Israel and to make them His people. Yes. You gave something very interesting when you spoke. You said that God wanted to make them an example and that through them, God would use them as the example to the world. And I yeah. think the other uh, uh, point of this, the devil tries to twist uh, truth. So we hear sometimes that uh, Israel was God's people, but they failed God. So now God turns to the Gentiles and forgets about the Jew. And we, we miss this whole dynamic of reconciliation that comes that God is dealing with races in general, because we see in, in Revelation 7 that when when he brings together a seal, everybody comes out of every nation, kindred, and tongue on the face of the earth. But we get back to the initial understanding of this, is that God called one man out to create a nation, Abraham, so that mm -hmm. through this nation, some things were going to happen that was going to really see us in a different light than uh, where we were. So this nation, this uh, Sinai journey that you mentioned was used and was going to create a model for the rest of the world. Yes. Not an exclusive model, but an inclusive model. Yes. I'll let you pick up from there. I just well, wanted to yes, back up. And that's a very good point, Dennis. And thanks for slowing me down because I get on a roll and I, <laughs> so I, I lose track of where I am. I just get caught up to see the glories in the story. I get, right. in the glory of the story. I get lost. But you're right. Um, God was not saying of Israel that you are the, the absolutely best people I've, I've ever made. You're my favorite child and you're, mm -hmm. you're better than the rest of the kids. No, that's not what he was saying. He had to pick out somebody to convey the truth through a human agency. Uh, and he told Israel, listen, it's not because you were the greatest, the, the most, the most powerful that I chose you, but I chose you because you were the meek and you were the, you were the persona non gratis. I want to, I want to show my glory. So even that, which is not great in the natural. And again, God's desire was that we be inclusive, that the gospel is a gospel uh, that includes everybody, whosoever will, mm -hmm. whosoever will. And the key word is will. Uh, if you don't want to be in the family, you don't have to be in the family. Mm -hmm. But everybody is welcome, and the price has been paid. The, may, the way has been made for everybody. I don't care if you're Chinese, Latino, Black, White, Asian, whatever you might be, <laughs> European, uh, you know, from South America, Central America all four corners of the globe, every human being, male or female, young or old, we are all welcome to the table of the Lord to eat at our father's table. Yes. And he paid the price for all of us to be there. Mm -hmm. That's the gospel of inclusion. And uh, mm -hmm. I hate to use that word because of a, my, <laughs> uh, of a friend of mine. <laughs> who's yeah, that's okay. Uh, but that gospel of inclusion, and, and I will say this, because we know I'm talking about Carlton Pearson right now for quickly, but I, mm -hmm. I recognize that the gospel has what's called uh, the objective truth of what God has done, what God has done. Right. But the objective truth of what God has done, that's the good news, also has a subjective side of the gospel, which is what we must do to bring us into agreement with what God has done. And there is the basis, the nexus of reconciliation. I agree. And Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John 17, he, he was praying for this. Uh, he, he, he talked about the glory that he had before the foundation of the world. 
he asked God to kind of uh, look over his disciples, and he gave this pattern from the Father to him, to the disciples, to the world. And he kept that fourfold pattern going throughout John 17, that there was to be this <clears throat> transition of bringing the unity between, as him and the Father were already united, that he would be united with his disciples, and the disciples would take the message to the world, and the world would then be reconciled to Christ, and Christ would then reconcile everyone back to the Father. It, it, when you read the prayer, it is interesting how that circular of events occur, and we see the, the reconciliation that begins to come in, in all of this. But I think that while we're talking, and I, and I love the way you brought up objective truth and subjective truth, because one of the things we have to get back to is this objective truth that we had to get back to in the Old Testament. This is what we were faced with throughout the Old Testament, that there was a pluralistic understanding of gods. And so this proliferation of idol gods and things that were going on caused God to move one man into a nation and come to a monotheistic viewpoint of God. And God began to show, this is how we really worship me. Not in objects, not in things, as Paul suggested in Romans 1, they start worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And yeah. so the whole idea of getting us back to the creator and not focus on the creation was a job that comes into the reconciliation of Jesus Christ coming into the world. See, if we don't know why we need to be reconciled, we won't want to be reconciled. We, we don't know what we lost <clears throat> and that uh, the relationship that we had, the things that's going on. So all this tyranny and the things that are going on in the world is because we need to be reconciled. There's hostility between God and man. And uh, I love Psalms 2 where it talks, he, he that sits in the heaven laughs. And, uh, and so he's laughing at the fact that man is trying to make its way through his own attempts rather than through the attempts that come through God. And now we see this whole redemptive journey throughout the Bible. And this is how you have to see the journey. It's a journey of redemption. So we see the drama being played out throughout the drama, coming down through the Bible and the, the devil distorting objective truth with subjective truth. And now getting to the point that he has Israel thinking they're to be exclusive and that they are the only ones who are God's people. And anyone who hasn't doing what they're doing, they, they kind of shut them out. Instead of trying to pull people in, they were shutting out and probably had to change that dynamic. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we bring this uh, program to a conclusion today, because we can pick <laughs> it up later, I just want to say two things, two more things, and then I'm out. <laughs> that is, you, you, Dennis, you mentioned the hostility. And we have to remember that there's somebody at work here who doesn't want the family to idea to come together. And that's the devil. He that's really right. is working. And that's why we have to be filled with the power of God and the truth of his word, because we cannot defeat the work of the devil who comes to kill, steal, and destroy without the spirit of God, without the word of God, without living somewhat of a sanctified life. That is right. absolutely cr a crucial to our understanding. And we've talked about, and this is how we also, if we abide in him, then we will bear fruit. Well, what's that fruit? That fruit is to be like him and to get involved in the opus day, the work of God. We're, we're joint heirs with him. We're, we're co-workers, co-laborers with God in the act of redemption. That's what he's all about. That's what he's doing. That's so right. that should be our mission. That should be our work by the Holy Spirit and his word to join our father in what's his heart. Let's make his heart our heart. Then next week, maybe we can talk about how we can reconcile to each other. That's where we come back to the racism. Yeah, I, I love it. We, and, and I guess we're going to be talking more dynamics about all this anyway. We might be on it for weeks. Okay. I think this is a good subject that we can sort of, we're not exhausting it. What we're going to try to make as clear as we can uh, this whole point. And, and I think that um, one of the things that we uh, will do, Dr. Van, as we uh, finish uh, some of the things that we're doing and, and work on this whole idea of coming together, uh, of being yeah. uh, united, that the Bible preaches unity. Right, and, bring in the uh, harmony, bring in the yeah, harmony. Bring us, bring us in the harmony. I love how you gave that definition. Reconciliation is to bring us into harmony. So as we harmonize the day and, and, and begin to come on same page about what we're doing in terms of the gospel, the evangelium, 
Uh, we're going to bring this idea that the gospel is good news that uh, basically, let me make it basic and elementary. It, it really says that God is not mad with you anymore. He's not, he's not yeah. upset with you. So uh, that's good news. Uh, God's not, news. he's not angry. He's not going to judge you. He's not going to eternally throw you away. Uh, you know, good news. Jesus has reconciled us back to God. That's, that's really the, the basis of the good news and, and the gospel. We'll talk more about the gospel as we bring this to, because as God did it for us, we turn around and give the invitation to other people. So yeah. uh, as John said, how can we love him who we've never seen and hate our brother who we see every day? So I, I, on a straight talk here, we just want to make sure you get to the point of understanding who God is, his monotheistic nature, his transcendent being, and come to the point of knowing where God is and what God is going to do. Uh, Van, you want to close us out? Yeah, <clears throat> I just want to, again, just say that the, the good news, the bisra in Hebrew, uh, this is the greatest story ever told, right. and the glory is in the story, and there's no greater mission on earth or heaven that God is reconciling. He's bringing us back into agreement with him, and he has already sent his son to pay the price on Calvary so that we could be reconciled. He fills us with his spirit, so we're empowered to reconcile, and that's just good news all the way around that God has done it all. Our Father in heaven has made a way for all of us to sit at the table and enjoy his presence and the rest of the family for the glory of God. <laughs> well, you heard it. This is our straight talk for the day. And uh, we, I want to thank Dr. Van. And we just kind of just bounced off each other in terms of where we are uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament and seeing where we are bringing this. And let me just say in conclusion that we can't do any of this without the being baptized in the Holy Spirit. This mm -hmm. whole idea of being drenched in God's spirit, getting uh, our pneumatology together so we can understand where he is and how he must play a role in it. Because in Ephesians 1, it says he is our seal guaranteeing us our inheritance until Jesus comes. So until next time, this is Straight Talk with Dr. Van Gaten and Dr. Dennis Goffin. Um, Van, you always give us a benediction, so you want to give our benediction? Yes. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon each one and give you shalom in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Shalom. See you next time. Thank you.